I'm Linda Middlesworth, a vegan mentor, and I'm the host of Go Healthy Live. I'm so glad you're here with us today because I have one of my favorite people, Andrew Taylor. He's been here before to California as a speaker, and he is an amazing man with an amazing story that you really want to know about. I think it will help a lot of us. Um, he, I'm going to let you tell what it is about, but it is it does concern potatoes and it does concern food addiction. And he's going to tell you about that. He was quite an athlete as a youth. He had the junior, uh, he had the junior Australian champion marathon kayaker award. He has a degree in applied science. He taught high school physical education and health classes. At one point though, he got up to over 334 pounds. And he did a little research and then he's gonna tell you what happened after that. So with that, I'm gonna introduce you to my friend, Andrew Taylor. Thank you for having me, Linda. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, we were just discussing before the interview that it's, uh, it's four years ago, pretty much to the day that I came and visited your house and stayed with you. And it, it doesn't feel like four years ago. That feels mm -hmm. like, you know, like a, a few months ago. <laughs> I but, know. Uh, yeah, good to, good to be talking with you again. And thanks for having me. Um, I, a lot has happened since I met you then too. So much more has happened, but tell us the beginning of what, what went on and how you even got started. Yeah, well, well thanks for that lovely introduction. Uh, yeah, I, I basically, I was a, a junior athlete, as you mentioned, I was an elite athlete. And of course, my, my junior athletic career ended up finishing and I, uh, and when I went into the senior ranks, uh, I got to the point where, you know, as a junior, I was always five to 10 pounds overweight and I was fit enough and strong enough that I could make up for that and still, you know, win races and be competitive. But once I got into the senior ranks, that five to 10 pounds was a, that made the difference between being one of the top guys and, and not being able to keep up anymore. So it was demoralizing for me and I basically quit the sport. Uh, well, I didn't quit. I still, I like kayaking and I still did it on my own, but I just stopped going to squad training and I stopped racing because I just couldn't get rid of that five to 10 pounds that was stopping me from getting to the, the upper echelons of the sport in the senior ranks. Um, so over the next decade, my my weight slowly crept on i stayed fit i stayed athletic i was playing australian football which is a very physical very hard game um, and i was still a very fit very strong guy but i just my weight was creeping up and creeping up and creeping up and um and then eventually i became a father for the first time and, and anyone who's a parent out there uh, knows that that's a difficult time. And for a long time, I thought of that as being simultaneously the best and worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, <laughs> and, and obviously the best because, you know, you've never known a love like that, uh, like you, the love that you feel for your kids and all of those sorts of things, but it also made life very difficult. Um, and to cut a long story short, I, I didn't sleep as most parents know, but, you know, it was extreme level of, of that. Like there was, I was... For probably two years, I was living on two to three hours of broken sleep every night, and it really played a, a uh, you know, a destructive role in my life. Uh, I ended up uh, clinically depressed and anxious, uh, and I stopped exercising totally. I didn't do any exercise, and uh, and my eating habits went further downhill. How and old I, were you about then? Uh, my first son was born when I was 33 um so yeah over the following couple of years the weight just piled on and on and on and, and I went from being just like a fit but overweight guy to being a very unfit morbidly obese guy um and and uh and yeah I, I got to the point where uh enough was enough and I, and I had a realization one day that I was a teacher for a long time right and any time I was thinking about parent-teacher interviews, when you meet the parents, and I was thinking about how every time I've ever had a kid who I didn't really understand or I was curious about how they got to be the way they were, whether it was a, a positive, you know, you know, a, a, an excellent kid who was excelling in class or an athlete or whether it was someone who was having trouble, whatever the case may be, every time I met the parents, everything made sense because kids are always like their parents, you know, there's 
of course they're different in lots of ways but you know nearly every time you know the core of the being is very similar to their parents and when i had that realization i thought you know that was at that point in time being like me was the very last thing i wanted for my son i just i couldn't think of anything worse than you know my son growing up to be like me uh <laughs> and and yeah that was obviously a very sad thing because i i was doing everything i could to be the best dad that i could and and you know no matter how hard i tried i no matter you know what i did um if i continued to let my life go down the way it was then i felt like well i was failing as a dad because my son was going to be like me oh. and, and uh yeah so that was the beginning of of trying again um and the first thing i did was a complete failure <laughs> after that I, you know so what, what did you do? What was the first thing? Yeah, well, it's, I think it's an important point to to raise that I didn't just have this lightning bolt moment and then suddenly everything was good. I I decided to start a new thing, uh, and I uh, my thing was I was doing a lot of green smoothies, a lot of salads. I had this, you know, I was trying to be whole food, plant based. Um, <laughs> I was, you know, green smoothies, salads, healthy dinners, and you know, like just really good plan i was getting up early in the morning and exercising even though i wasn't sleeping i was still making the effort to get up and exercise did you and have really dairy well. did you have dairy in there then no no i, I was ve i've been vegan since 2006 so, oh, okay so you already yeah, vegan I, but you weren't successful i was successful at being vegan <laughs> but i, mean, I wasn't successful, successful at, at your weight vegan. yeah yeah i was i was eating all the vegan junk food you know and um, I always say that, that, you know, vegan ice cream, I think is probably healthier than non-vegan ice cream, but yeah. the, lesser of, the lesser of two evils is still evil. <laughs> it's still going to yeah. make you fat. And that's what it did to me. So yeah, my, I was vegan for an animal rights thing. That was, that was why I was vegan. I didn't become vegan to, to get healthier. Like fine. I got no problem. You know, if you want to, if you become Thank vegan you. to get healthier, that's great. But I, for me, it was about animal rights and, um, and yeah, I neglected myself. So, so yeah, I did this, this month of being extra healthy and I did great. I was getting fitter. I didn't weigh myself, but I know I was losing weight because my clothes fit better and all of that. And, and after a month, Andrew, how did you know just to become vegan, even though it was junk food, processed food? How did you know well, to do that part? Uh, well, in the beginning, it was it was just an animal rights thing. I'm, I did you I see tried. a film with animals? How did you know about that? Well, it was just an idea. the 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 spark for that came when uh, I got my first teaching job, and it was out in a very small country town. Uh, and the main employer there was an abattoir. Well, it's a slaughterhouse, so that was the number one employer. So I was playing Australian rules football with guys there who. They were, I thought they were good guys. Well, they were good guys. There's no doubt. They were, they were good guys. They were, you know, really lovely people who would do anything for you. And um, except, you know, obviously they worked in slaughterhouses and uh, oh. in slaughterhouse. And I heard stories that just chilled I me. See. It was I horrible. Um, but at the time I was, I, I was, the, you know, I was a, a manly man. I was a footballer. <laughs> I was a big, strong, manly man. And I thought I needed my meat. And it, and it was like, okay, the slaughterhouse sounds horrible, but I don't know what I can do about that. I've got to eat my meat. So it was still a couple of years after that where I, I was in a pub having a beer and I met a slaughterhouse worker whose job was putting the bolt gun into the cow's brains. Um, and, and I won't tell you all the details, but that was, I had a long conversation with her. It was a female, which I guess is probably unusual. And, and I had a long conversation with her. And at the end of that night, I was like, I can't do this. I just can't I do see. it. I and, see. Um, and then, yeah, then I did a little bit of research and found out that actually you don't need protein. You don't need to eat meat to get protein. I thought I'll give it a try for a month and I'll see if I'm okay. And I was. So, um, yeah, that was 2006 that I did and that. And to clear up one thing, when you say footballer, you mean soccer, right? No, I mean Australian football. It's, oh, you mean Australian football? Okay, just yeah, wanted to make Australian sure. Australian football. Probably Google that if you haven't seen it. It's uh, it's a very <laughs> physical, very brutal game. Very physical. Down. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, so, that's a man's man's game. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, yeah, no, and, and being a, a big guy that I am, that's like, you know, uh, my job in that game is to, is to hit hard. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so, you know, a bit like in American football, the big guys, yeah. the big guy's job is to be physical and, and, you know, hit. That's, that's and ram into each other. Yeah. Yeah. The smaller guys, they run around and they still hit, but you know, they, they try not to get hit mostly. But yeah. the big guys, your job is to hit. And um, and that was sort of my job as well. Um, so yeah, I was I took pride in being a very, very big, very strong. Uh, I, 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 at the time I was much bigger and stronger than I am now. I don't lift weights every day like I used to then. But uh, but yeah, that was my background and um and <laughs> And yeah, so I became vegan for the animal rights. And uh, and in the beginning, it was a long time ago, there wasn't so many junk foods available. So in the beginning, of course, I lost weight. And you know, I wasn't hugely overweight to begin with, but I did lose some weight. But I didn't really equate that to, you know, the whole food plant based diet. I just thought that's what happens when you go vegan. And then did, all the vegan yeah, junk foods. And excuse me, did, you, did you know what was happening? Dairy cows? Because that was the one that I didn't get until I was 44 years old, the dairy cow thing. I thought, well, they milk the cow and we get the cheese and yum. And I didn't get yeah. the connection of the violence and the cruelty behind dairy and cheese and yogurt and ice cream. Yeah, well, Did you understand with, that connection already? Yeah, well, the first connection was what happens at the slaughterhouses. You know, I, I thought of, you know, humane death. That was what I'd always thought. And then that was totally blown apart that there was it's anything but humane, the death of these animals. And then then because I had that learning that happened about what, you know, this is not true. All this humane death stuff is just not true. And that yeah. made me think, well, what else is not true? So then I did a lot of research oh. into the rest you of were, the animals. You, you went and found out about the dairy then and, and yeah, the so, and so all then, that. Yeah, exactly. I didn't, I wouldn't say I learned everything all at once, you know, over the years, you still hear new bits and pieces of information that you're like, what the, you know, but in the beginning, yeah, I did know, I, I made it a point to learn about that. Um, so did yeah. you know about the chickens who went down, who the boy chickens, yeah. male chickens who were killed immediately yeah. in a grinder? Did you know about yeah, that? Yeah, you know? I did. I, 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 I made it a point to learn about all of that sort of stuff. And uh <laughs> Yeah, because I wanted to be able to keep all these other foods in my diet, you know, okay, I've heard about how the cows get treated. I can't eat cows anymore. Hopefully I can still eat pigs. Let's find out about pigs. Oh, no, I can't eat them. Oh, hopefully I can still have cheese. Let's find out about that just to make sure. And oh, no, okay, I can't eat cheese and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I wanted to, do, I wanted to make sure gradual, that- Gradual, gradual learning there. Yeah, but it was in the space of a few days, you know. Oh, like, all of it? Oh, my. Yeah. Well, there was that first um, thing where living in the town with the slaughterhouse and then a couple of years later, there was that conversation with the woman in the bar. And then after that conversation, it was a few days. And then I was like, I, I'm done. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Pretty fast then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, it took a couple of years to go vegan overnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I wish I did it earlier, but yeah, that's the way it went. I always say that too. Why didn't somebody tell me? It's funny that not one doctor told me how to fix my bad health. Not one doctor told me that my food was incorrect for me because obviously doctors don't know nutrition at all. And none of mine did. Still today, yeah. I have one now who's a vegan, but back then I didn't know any vegan doctors, not one. Yeah. And I think they're becoming more aware now and taking the American College of Lifestyle Medicine course and getting yep. board certified and that is so wonderful i wish all doctors had to take that course so yeah. did, you, did you have did you ever talk to your doctor about what was going on with you no he, he or she not, saying no, not really no i did talk to psychologists because i was diagnosed as being mm -hmm. um you know depressed and anxious uh, and um yeah so i did talk to psychologists about it but no i didn't really Obviously, I was I was hugely obese, and it wasn't going to be long, I guess, until I had major health problems associated with that. But at, uh, really, you know, I was a healthy fat guy <laughs> as far as that's you possible. You didn't have anyway. you didn't have major heart disease or cancer or no, anything. No, no. I was pre-diabetic, but that oh, okay. you know, that diagnosis happened when I'd already started potatoes only. So I was like, there's no need to do anything about it because I'm already doing it. You know, there was yeah. 
I didn't, I never went to the doctor. I wasn't a guy who went to the doctor just to get checkups and stuff. So I don't know, I probably had problems that I didn't know about. Probably had high blood pressure and, uh, you know, my high, my cholesterol was high, but I didn't know that until, you know, my, one of my wife's conditions on me doing this potato only year thing. She said, yeah, she supported me fully, but she wanted me to get a checkup from a doctor. So the first, you know, in, the, in week one, I got a checkup and these health issues came up that I didn't know existed before. So it yeah, wasn't like I was I trying to solve any health problems. I was just, I, I avoided the doctor at all costs until that point. <laughs> so you just didn't feel good about yourself because you were so large and yeah you felt, you felt physically like you could still work and do things mentally yeah. i couldn't work i had taken time off work and i had to quit a job because i just couldn't mm. i couldn't face the day so yeah my mental health was in in very poor shape mm-hmm. but yeah physically i was you know i was okay i was able to do what i needed to do to get through the day but you know i was very long way from what i wanted to be i couldn't you know get on the floor and wrestle with my kid and and you know, I couldn't yeah. go and I couldn't even fit in my kayak. Like there's just no, there's no point even having yeah. a kayak. I actually, I actually got sick of looking at my kayak in the garage. It, it was so depressing for me. And I still, it still makes me sad because my racing kayak, it, it was an elite level, just a beautiful piece of equipment sitting in my garage. Oh. And I couldn't bear looking at it. So I sold it for like a quarter of the price that I should have sold it just because I wanted it out of my sight. And then, you know, six months later, I could have fit in it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what did, um, were you taking any medication at the time for depression or anything like that? Yeah, I was prescribed with, uh, yeah, medication. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I didn't end up taking it for long, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly, I think I would have been okay if I didn't take it because I, the diet ultimately helped me change all of that uh, for mm-hmm. a number of different reasons. The diet had a huge impact on on my mental health. Uh, if uh, actually this is probably something that can be helpful to people. So the the common prescription for de- depression is called uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Oh yeah. And, mm-hmm. and what so SSRIs? Uh, like and what, Prozac, uh, like Prozac and things like that. Yeah, they're the typical mainstream uh, yeah, medications for depression. So mm-hmm. your your brain produces some serotonin, that's a sort of feel-good hormone. It circulates in your brain a little bit, and then as it reuptake inhibitor, it, it gets re-up reuptake and reabsorbed. Mm-hmm. Right. So the reuptake inhibitor is there to stop the reabsorption of serotonin and, and allow it to continue circulating in your brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the idea behind that is that if you've got more serotonin in your brain, then you feel better. It improves yeah. your mood. Um, so I one thing I that really know, works. I wonder if that really works. Does it help? You think? Yeah, it does help, but it doesn't. It's not a normal sort of good feeling. It's it is a better like it does help. Yeah, well, it did help yeah. me, but you know. Yeah. Um, but the, the the interesting thing is that only five percent of your serotonin is made in your brain, and the other ninety five percent is made in your digestive system in your gut. So oh, when wow. I started eating potatoes, I started getting all this glorious fiber <laughs> and the resistant starch and all this other good stuff that's in a potato that that improves your gut bacteria uh, and creates a really nice environment in your digestive system for serotonin production. And so I suddenly, you know, my serotonin production in my gut has just gone through the roof. And <laughs> And then I had so I had so much extra serotonin circulating, and and that made a huge impact on on my mental health. That um, must be so why potatoes are my number one food. Before I even comfort. met you, before I met you, potatoes have been, been my lifesaver too. Yeah, mm. they make me feel good. Damn yeah, right they do. Yeah, and that's a yeah. big reason why. Yeah. Yeah. So. So what so, happened? Yeah. Sorry. So what happened? How did you um, go from that state to the next one? Yeah, yeah. So I had this this failed attempt that I mentioned with the green smoothies and the salads and all that. And basically that ended up with a month of doing really, really well. And at the end of the month, I thought, right, I deserve a treat. I deserve a reward for having a good month. And, <laughs> and I, so I ordered a pizza. Uh, and, oh, oh, no. Yeah, so, but I, you know, I told myself I'd have one slice of pizza and then I'll go back to being healthy tomorrow. Yeah. And um, of course, everyone knows how that ends. I had the whole the whole family size pizza to myself. Um, 
and, and oh, I had a, you yeah. know, a, a tub of ice cream and some Coca Cola to go with it, and oh, uh, yeah, wow. and it was a, it was a huge binge. And then the next morning, um, you know, I made all these bargains with myself about getting up early and doing extra training and all that to make up for it, and none of it happened. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the next can't day, exercise off a bad diet, can we? No. And the next day, I, I was I was just feeling really down and sorry for myself about having let this, you know, yet again, I've let this diet slip. This time, it, it wasn't even about me. It was about trying to be a good example for my kid. And I couldn't even do that properly. You know, I was just a total loser and a failure. And, mm. um, and I, I, you know, of course, I was depressed and I wasn't thinking right. And then and the next thing I thought was, okay, the best thing I can do now to improve my mood is I'll get a beer. So I went to the fridge and I got a beer. And I went back and sat on the couch. And as I sat down, I cracked open this beer and it suddenly hit me just out of the blue that, hey, I've been treating food all my life the same way an alcoholic would treat this beer that's in my hand. And it's like, you know, everybody knows an alcoholic or probably more than one who has said, yeah, I'm quitting alcohol. I'm not going to drink anymore. And they do really well for you know a few weeks, a few months, a few years, whatever. And then a special event comes up and they, they'll go, you know, one beer, it's my best friend's wedding. I'll have one beer and then tomorrow I'll, I'll go back to being sober. And of yeah. course, that one beer is, you know, it's the beginning of the end. Trigger, yep. And that was the same, exact same way I behaved with food over my whole life. And I'd do that one month like I had just finished doing. One slice of pizza won't hurt me. And of course, you know, it's the beginning of the end. So I figured in that moment that if, if an alcoholic should quit alcohol, then wouldn't it be great if a food addict should, could quit food? And that, because that was the moment that I realized I was an addict. I didn't realize addiction was my problem until then. And, and, uh, and yeah, I thought, well, if, if, well, you if have to eat, is, you have to eat to survive. So it's even harder than alcohol, I think, because, yeah. well, I, I haven't you really, have to eat anyway. So, yeah. I have, I have heard lots of people say, lots of people who are alcoholics say that quitting, you know, dealing with the food addiction is harder than dealing with alcohol. I don't have that experience myself, but, mm -hmm. but lots of alcoholics have told me that food is a much bigger, harder problem than alcohol. Um, well, we need, so, it. Yeah, we need to eat it all the time. We have to eat food. So, yeah. 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 So that's mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, I figured that, you know, we can't quit food. We've got to eat, like you said. So the next best thing to quitting would be to see if I can find one food that I could eat and quit everything else, get as close as possible to quitting. So I did a lot of research. As you mentioned, I've, I've got a science degree. Uh, and actually, incidentally, I'm working on becoming a doctor. I'm studying a, a, to be a doctor at the moment. So I've started that as well. But anyway, you know, I've, I used my science degree, my knowledge of science, to do a lot of research and figured out that, yeah, if I was going to quit everything except one food, then potatoes would be the obvious choice. And, uh, and then I did a lot of thinking about it and I ended up deciding to do a whole year of nothing but potatoes. And that was 2016. Wait a uh, minute, you, yeah. ate, it, you, you were gonna do a whole year eating yeah. only potatoes. You made up your mind that you didn't need anything else, just potatoes. Why did you pick yeah. the potato? Well, there was, yeah, there was a potatoes and a B12 supplement. That was my, my thing, but yeah, there's, there was a lot of research, basically. There was a few foods that I considered, but um, yeah, nothing had nothing else really had the historical data and the scientific data to support it. Uh, but yeah, potatoes, you can look throughout history. They've sustained entire civilizations before. The most like obvious... The Scottish, it wasn't Ireland or Scotland? Irish, thing? yeah. The Irish. For couple, yeah, for a couple of centuries, the Irish population lived on not not only potatoes, but very close to only potatoes. Yeah. Uh, and they went through a, a population boom. Uh, and, you know, they were noted at the time by writers to be bigger, stronger, more physically attractive than, you know, the English who were their neighbours and essentially living in the same climate, but not eating the same diet. Um, <laughs> And, and yeah, they, the Irish did really, really well. And there are several other examples. Even to this day, there are, there are Papua, New Guinea, Papua New Guinean Highlander tribes that live on only sweet potatoes, for example. Um, and, you know, they pretty much eat only sweet potatoes, except for on feast days and celebration days where they might um, include some other foods. But, you know, I could go on and on. There was a, there was a study done in the, uh, 
in the 1920s, I think it was. It's a long time since I've read about this, but um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was in the 1920s of a marathon running couple from Poland. Uh, oh, and they, they did six months of only potatoes. And at the end of six months of nothing but potatoes, they ran personal best marathons. Um, oh my goodness. So, you know, it was, it was obvious that, uh, you know, that's some research that shows that potatoes are healthy and have kept people healthy. But then on top of that, you know, you can just look for, look at the nutrition content in potatoes and, and they, they cover everything really, really well. So, um, yeah. Everybody was, says potatoes make you fat though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like to say that, you know, potatoes have sort of become in, in modern society, they've become a, a garbage delivery system. That's, that's the way they work. And it's, um, yeah, potatoes are a beautiful thing, but when you load them up with garbage, then then they yeah, of it's, course, it's you what know, you put on the potato that makes you fat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, we we typically load them up with you know we deep fry them, we cook them in oil, we load them up with sour cream and bacon, bacon bits, bits and cheese, and mm -hmm. and then we blame the potato. Yeah. <laughs> but I still have so many um, new clients of mine. I try to talk them out of this. I can't have potatoes, Linda. I have diabetes and I cannot have potatoes. Yeah. And, and um, I had pre-diabetes and I got rid of my pre-diabetes by eating so many potatoes. So I know it works. And of course, as a food for life instructor with Dr. Neil Bernard, the potatoes aren't the problem. It's the fat. And uh, potatoes have like 1% fat or something very, very low. So it's easy yeah. to it's, easy to get your body weight to what it should be eating potatoes as you know so what happened with the potatoes then yeah well uh, i potatoes were yeah they, they were super healthy and they helped me to lose weight and and i also um doing that year of only potatoes just the, the biggest thing that came from it for me was the changes in my mental health and, and my relationship with food. That was what it was all about was um, um, you know, I had a very unhealthy relationship with food. And, and I realized that over my life, I had been, um, I'd been uh, using food as a source of comfort and, and um, enjoyment and emotional support. And, uh, and yeah, eating only potatoes sort of highlighted those issues for me and allowed me to see with clarity uh, what I'd been doing for my whole life and how it had been affecting my life. So, so yeah, it gave me some time and space without being, uh, without the distraction of all the other foods to, yeah. to, to look at my life and look at my relationship with food and start thinking about things differently and doing things differently. Sorry. And uh, yeah. Did that anybody was the, think you were crazy at that point? <laughs> the whole world thought I was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was uh yeah, uh, after a month uh, of doing only potatoes, I lost 10 kilos or 20, 22 pounds or something that is. Yeah. And, and that was in the first month. And then, um, and then, uh -huh. yes, the media got hold of my story and it went viral all around the world. And yeah, so basically the whole world thought I was crazy. And uh, I bet they did. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I, that but was then look at you. You yeah. when you when it went viral, had you lost all your weight yet? No, no, it was. <clears throat> I went viral in the beginning of February, so I started at the beginning of January. I went mm -hmm. viral in the middle of February for the first wow. time, uh, and then so yeah, I, I lost 120 pounds. But when it first went viral, I had lost just over 20 pounds, um, mm -hmm. and and then yeah, it, it sort of. It had moments of peaks and troughs through the year, but you know, all the everyone who had interviewed me in the beginning wanted to interview me again after six months, and then again when the year was finished. So it sort of had three cycles of viralness. <laughs> and uh, did you have your doctor checking you all along, or yeah, I got blood tests and health medical checkups all the way through. I uh, had four different times throughout the year, and yeah, everything just kept on getting better and better, and. Yeah, it was interesting to see all, all the experts that were in the media uh, criticizing me were, you know, it was interesting to see how the criticism changed. Yeah. The the Did you say you had pre-diabetes um, before you started the potatoes? Yeah, well, it came out in my very first medical checkup that I did during week one that, yeah, my blood sugars were high, my cholesterol was high. 
you know, all these sorts of things. And, and yeah, it just got better throughout the whole year. Everything got better. All my blood tests just improved as the year went on. So at the yeah. end of the year, had everything normalized with your numbers or? After three months, things had normalized mostly. Yeah, I got it. After I got check three up. months? Yeah, wow. I got, I got check up at the beginning and then three, six, nine and, and 12 months. So you were um, already feeling really great three months into it. I felt amazing after two weeks. I just, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. but I didn't get another checkup until three months. And, and you know, that checkup confirmed what I was already feeling after two weeks. Yeah, I, my, my weight obviously continued to go down. But as far as feeling healthy, I, I felt great after two weeks. Um, wow. Uh, and it was just up to my weight just had to catch up. <laughs> yeah, that is just amazing. Do you feel strong? Did you feel like you're physically not weak or anything? You just felt stronger or you felt the same or what happened there? I felt stronger. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, when was it? Beginning of October, I, I ran a half marathon, you know, at the beginning of the year, I could hardly walk up a flight of stairs without losing wow. my breath. And oh, uh, wow. 10 months later, I, went, I ran, uh, well, the, the course for in, in Tasmania in Hobart, we went, me and my son went on a little holiday to visit my parents who were down there at the time and and on a on the saturday afternoon i i stumbled on the internet across this thing in in hobart they call it the world's toughest half marathon and basically it starts at sea level and they just go straight up a mountain and finish at the oh. top of the mountain and, I'm sorry, uh, that sounds awful <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and uh and yeah, that it wasn't the time of year for that race, but I saw that race and thought, oh, that's interesting. I, I wonder about that. And then uh, you didn't thought, train for this. You no, didn't no. Train. Well, I had been running. I didn't train. I, I'd been. Uh, I'd run some ten k, you know, running on my own, like just uh, done some of that sort yeah. of thing. So never. But not training uphill or or anything. You know, just flat, just running around my neighbourhood, just enjoying having a run, and then. Yeah, Saturday afternoon, I thought I'll go and give this a try. So I didn't do the official event, but I ran the same course as the yeah. as this event goes on. And yeah, I just decided on Saturday afternoon and I did it on Sunday morning and it was fine. I just, yeah, I just ran up a mountain. Fine. Wow, oh, that's such a great story. <laughs> yeah, so that was cool. It was like, I thought it was going to be a massive struggle and I, you know, but I felt like, well, I'm only here for the weekend. I might as well give it a <laughs> shot. And yeah, it was, it was okay. You know, it was hard. It was hard, but it wasn't like, you know, it didn't destroy me. I just, I just went and did it. And at the end, I've got a photo on my Instagram. If you want to search all the way back, it's me <laughs> standing on top of the mountain with my arms up. And, oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> so was that three months or where was that? That was after 10 months. I did that. 10 yeah. months. Okay. Did you have any trouble gaining weight during, since you became famous over the spud? spud year have you had any trouble like going up too much down too much or in your weight change or or mood well, change i don't weigh myself like anymore i weighed myself nearly every day for that year and the reason i weighed myself was because i was getting asked questions all the time about my weight loss and i wanted to have an answer but my my aim for that year was very deliberately to have no weight loss goal the only aim i had for the year was to just eat potatoes and see what happens yeah. Like, like, it was an addiction problem. It wasn't a weight problem for me. It was an addiction yeah. problem. And I wanted to deal with the addiction and just see what happens with the weight. I was, that was very important. So I deliberately had no weight loss goal. And then once that year was over and I did lose all the weight, and of course, I'm very grateful that I lost all the weight. Um, but yeah, that was not the point. Um, and then, so yeah, once the year was over and I was stopped getting asked about what I weighed every day, I stopped weighing myself and I haven't weighed myself since. Um, I focus on behavior, um, making yeah. sure that I'm making the right choices. Like we said, continually make the right choices consistently over and over, meal after meal, day after day, week after week, make the right choices. So I don't know what I weigh. I haven't weighed myself in, well, since the beginning of 2017. Yeah, um, weighing yourself can be the problem, can't it? I mean, you go up yeah. a little pound, you go down a few pounds, and then people get upset over that, right? And then yeah. they eat something because they're upset over their weight. Yeah, and, and I'm not for or against weighing yourself. For me, I prefer not to, but I get for some people it helps them to be weigh themselves every day, some people every week, some people every month. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm on the fence about this. It's not, I don't care if you want to yeah. weigh yourself, weigh yourself. 
I feel better not weighing myself, focusing on my behaviors and, and, uh, and yeah, if I'm, like I said, if, if I'm making the right choices consistently, then my weight will be what it will be. Um, so yeah, that's what I focus on. I don't know what I weigh. I assume it's around about the same as when I finished because my clothes still fit the same. So <laughs> that's all I can say. Yeah. So what happened? Um, how did you branch off your other life and start the spud foot challenge and everything? How did that happen? Yeah, that was a whole <laughs> weird process in itself. So basically, uh, yeah, of course, my story went viral and, and, and I thought I was the only person in the world suffering with a food addiction. That was a, you know, I felt like the only person in the world. And then, of course, I got a, thousands and thousands of people writing to me that yeah. resonated with my story. And um, so I spent hours every day answering emails from people trying to help people. And and one day, you know, after six months or something, I said to my wife, you know, I get the same questions every day. I wasn't complaining. Well, I guess it was in a way because I, I want to help people, but I'm getting the same questions every single day. I'm answering the same questions and it's good. I'm glad that I'm able to help people with these questions. But at the same time, it's like there must be a better way than just answering emails every day and answering the same questions over and over and over again. And my wife said, well, why don't you write a book, write down all the questions that people ask put them all in a book and yeah. then and then uh and then hopefully people can buy the book get all the answers to the questions and they never have to email you and then i'll have more time to you know be a better dad and better husband and all those sorts of things and so okay great i wrote a book and uh, that book's called the diy spud fit challenge you can if you if you if you just look on amazon for spud fit you'll see two books there one of them is the diy spud fit challenge or you can go to spudfit.com and look at the books there but anyway yeah that was the first book and and it, the funny thing happened i wrote the book and i released it and thought right now i can stop answering emails because everyone will get the book instead but yeah. it, it only made the emails increase <laughs> i got more emails after that so i was like okay what am i going to do um okay and maybe another way to do it i'll make a course so yeah. so i made this big video course um, which is a big guided um, spud fit challenge, basically. It's, so it's guiding people through the spud fit challenge. There's 26 different lessons in there. There's worksheets. There's all this really detailed, really, you know, really heavy thing that can guide people through the whole process. And, and, um, and yeah, so I made this big course and thought, okay, people can do this course and then they'll stop emailing me and I'll have more time for my day. And Do you again, have recipe, recipes in there too? No, because okay. it's not about recipes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, there are some, re there are a few recipes in the book. Um, in both of my books, there are recipes, but um, in the course itself, no, there's not recipes. There are recipes for okay. living, recipes for changing the way you think, and recipes for, you know, the important things in life, but not recipes for making food. Yeah. Um, and it's a deliberate decision because I think we need to focus less on recipes. Recipe, of course, you need to cook, so you need some recipes, but you know, recipes are easy. The rest of learning how to stick with this in the long term is the hard bit. So that's the bit that I focus on. I find uh, people yeah. get really stuck on recipes and mm -hmm. and I have clients who say, oh, I need, I need to change, Linda. But see, I don't understand that because I'm kind of like you. I can eat potatoes all day long, throw some broccoli in there, maybe have an apple and I'm happy, right? I yeah. don't need it to be complicated. And yeah. I feel like, and I think Dr. McDougall addresses this too, when people try to make complicated recipes all the time, for, number one, they get tired out. Uh, they don't have this ingredient or that ingredient. And so then they don't do well. They eat something they shouldn't. So instead of concentrating all these fancy recipes, nothing wrong with them. And I like to do that. Like at Christmas time, I will make yep. Chef AJ's vegan lasagna, right? It's more yep. high calorie density, but... For daily life, man, I just get those microwave potatoes out right? and or I air fry my potatoes or put them in the oven if you don't have an air fryer. But I just most of my food is potatoes and then I add some vegetables in there and maybe once in a while some almonds or, you know, but I just don't worry about it. I just love eating. And I yeah. think the longer you do this, the more each food becomes just so tasteful I don't need to put anything on it even you know yeah well I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about you know if if 
if you're obsessed with food and you've got a real problem with, you know, you, you've got all these in, intrusive thoughts about food and emotional issue, emotional eating problems and issues like that, then, you know, increasing the obsession with food is not the answer. And a lot of the time um, when you, you know, when you're searching for recipes and trying to find the next way to make the food more delicious and, you know, search for the, what I call food gasms, you know, it's an endless search for more food gasms. And, and I think, yeah, just what we need to do is really just turn the volume down, take a step back and relax around food and go, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's okay to just fill the tank, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, a cornucopia of gastronomic splendor with every yeah. mouth. You know? <laughs> it's, uh, I can't tell you how many clients of mine yeah. they want the, they see these delectable vegan foods on the internet and they want that too but yeah. you don't need it yeah. you simply don't need it yeah exactly so that's that's a, a big important thing for me that we need to just relax around food and just take it easy and and uh and yeah learn to see food more as fuel and you also uh, do a lot of like podcast interviews with people like Rich Roll and James Aspie and Dr. Doug Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer, right? Those are some yeah. of my some of my speakers too. Yeah, yeah, they're they're all great people. Uh, yeah, I've enjoyed doing the podcast. I haven't done one for a while now. It's sort of you know, COVID nineteen got in the way and uh, and life got a bit hectic there for a while. So the podcast hasn't happened for a while, but hopefully we'll get that happening. But yeah, these days I'm pretty busy with my study. As I mentioned earlier, I've gone back to yeah. university and I'm, you know, I've got a few years of study ahead of me before hopefully I'll become a doctor and, uh, you know, maybe you'll have That's me back so at the doctor awesome. instead of just doing some weird potato eating freak. <laughs> and when you're done with that, you come back and do another talk, okay? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so wonderful. Andrew, it's been such a delight to have you here with us today. I would like to know how do people get a hold of you? Can you tell them what what to do? Yeah, no worries. So um, spudfit.com, www.spudfit.com. You can email me, andrew at spudfit.com, or you know, I'm spudfit on all the social medias. So whichever one, just look up spudfit and you'll find me, except TikTok. I'm not on there yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. And I think you'll inspire a lot of people to not worry about um, making fancy recipes. Just eat food when you're hungry and or when you're not hungry. Just eat yeah. the right food. And exactly. thank you it's so the diet much. Mentality and just just make good choices. That's all you got to do. Yeah, the, you're so inspirational and amazing. Thank you so much for what you're doing for people now too. Thank you for having me and, uh, and yeah, keep up the good work. You're doing great things for people's health as well. So thank you for having me and good to see you again. Good to see you again, Andrew. Andrew Spudfit Taylor, everybody. Thank you.